Hello, welcome to Progressive Farming Company's How To Series on Managed Grazing Systems. I'm Emily, I'm the Sales Manager here at Progressive Farming, and I'm joined by James, who's the Director. Hi, Emily, thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. So in the series today, we are going to cover everything you need to know about designing your own grazing system. So who is Progressive Farming? Progressive Farming, we are a UK business, an online UK business, supplying electric fencing equipment, mobile watering equipment for livestock, plus energizers and tools. We are the UK stockist for KiwiTech. We also stock Hayes, Pell and Speedrite. You can find everything we stock and do on our website, www.progressivefarming.co.uk. There we list the whole range, including helpful how-to videos, all of our pricing, and you can buy direct on the website through our online shop. So I'm going to hand over to James now, who's going to talk through what we cover in this grazing series. Yeah, thanks, Emily. So this series is a five part series, and we're going to cover everything you need to know about how to design your own managed grazing system. That's going to include the benefits of managed grazing, design of the system, electric fencing, energizers, and earthing and water systems. So we look forward to sharing our knowledge with you and we really hope you can join us and, and you also enjoy working your way through this five part series. Part two, design. Grazing management shouldn't be hard work and a well-designed managed grazing system will enable the animals to move easily to new pasture with very low inputs of labor. This way, all of the benefits are realized costs are reduced, our animal performance is increased. So let's look at the design of managed grazing systems. When we think about design, we're generally focused on the grazing season, which in the UK for most of us is between April and October. In this period, recommended on time, the animal spend per area, be that a field or a paddock, is between one to five days. The recommended rest period is generally between 20 to 40 days to ensure sufficient plant recovery after grazing. Therefore, the number of paddocks per group of animals sits somewhere between a minimum of four to a, a maximum of 16. And this, these numbers were suitable for most farms and most situations. So let's have a look at how the number of paddocks interacts with the on time or number of days the animals spend in each paddock. The table you see on your screen has the number of paddocks per group along the top and the on time number of days the animals would spend in each paddock along the side. The boxes are color coded green for spring summer, yellow for autumn or for a dry summer, early spring or autumn and then an orange for autumn winter. This gives the number of the, the numbers in the table are the number of days between grazing events for a given combination of paddocks and on time. Let's look at one example. If we if we have eight paddocks for our group, then by varying the on time, we can vary the rotation length and therefore the rest period. So if we have eight paddocks and we spend three days a paddock, we have a rotation length of 24 days. The rest period for the pasture can be found by subtracting the on time from the rotation length. So eight paddocks, three days a paddock, it's a rotation length of 24 and a rest period of 21. From our previous slide, we can see that that is probably the minimum we'd like to achieve for most farms. So pasture will be growing quickly. You'll be able to rotate through the paddocks every three days giving the plants a rest period of 21 days. As pasture growth slows down, we'd need to increase the rotation length, therefore increasing the rest period. If we have eight paddocks, we could increase the on time to five days. That would increase the rotation length to 40. The rest period would be 40 minus five being 35 days. You can see that as we increase the number of paddocks per group, we can also increase the rotation length and therefore the rest period. So 
So once we've decided on the number of paddocks we'd like to use, we then have to think about a paddock size. So the paddock size should be the maximum size. The maximum size is governed by the area in which it can be eaten within five days with a chosen group of animals. So you may have a field that you can comfortably eat within five days and therefore no additional subdivision is needed. You can increase this maximum size by increasing the number of animals in the group. So for instance, rather than running two groups of 100 ewes and lambs, maybe run one group of 200 ewes and lambs and therefore the maximum paddock size is increased and less subdivision and therefore you know, infrastructure is needed. If there's any limits as to how many animals of one type you wish to run in a group, so maybe for instance the mobile sheep handling system won't accommodate 200 ewes and their lambs or there's not enough labour available to carry out routine treatments in a suitable time frame, it's certainly possible to mix stock classes together. For instance, ewes and lambs could be mixed with growing cattle to achieve a th in theory larger group without compromising individual animal performance. And that mixing of species can have other benefits for pasture productivity and pasture quality, as well as worm control. Generally, we'll set out to simplify systems and look to maximize group size to therefore maximize the size of the paddocks we can use. If we're going to need to split existing fields because we can't graze them within this five day time frame, then we'll aim for similar paddock sizes across all the fields we're going to use for the group. Two hectares is quite, a, quite often a really convenient size paddock to aim for. As you can see below, it gives four to five days grazing for 200 ewes and lambs, three to four days grazing for 40 cows and calves, and three to four days grazing for 60 yearlings. In terms of how much area might a group require, well, for most of us, you can use our previous experience. For instance, if last year you have four fields totaling 40 acres kept a group of 40 cows and calves going for most of the grazing season, then it's likely that will work again this year. But if those four fields aren't enough and we, we aspire to do better, we may split those four fields in half to make eight paddocks. And what we should see in that situation is this additional feed being generated because of the grazing management. There's been all the improvement in grazing management, a reduction in total on time, and probably increase in recovery period. If we don't have that previous experience to draw on, then you may be able to use this helpful table. Let's look at an example. For most improved pasture, the sort of mid season growth rates, so growth rates between the end of April and October, is going to sit or be around 40 kilos of dry matter per hectare. So from that, we can estimate appropriate, an appropriate stocking rate. And as highlighted here, if pasture is to grow at 40 kilos of, of dry matter per hectare, that's equivalent to 18 ewes and lambs per hectare or 2.7 cows per hectare. So if we have, if we know the size of our flock or herd, we can divide by the stocking rate to find the area required. For instance, if I have 180 ewes and their lambs, 180 divided by 18 means I would need 10 hectares for that group. If I have 40 cows and calves, 40 divided by 2.7 would mean I need around 15 hectares for that group. Once I know the area, I can then divide by my number of paddocks to find out or to calculate the paddock area. So for instance, if that group of 180 ewes and lambs had 10 hectares, and I wanted to achieve my minimum four paddocks, 10 divided by four means each paddock should be around two and a half hectares. So let's look at what layout we layout we are available when we come to, it comes to paddock grazing systems. This example shows what we would consider to be the minimum requirement for a managed grazing system. So it's got four paddocks, and this in this situation is perhaps a large field that's been divided into four equal paddocks using two temporary electric fences. A water trough's been placed in the middle, and that trough therefore services or serves each of the four paddocks. This is quite simple to install. 
but it's only, only gives four paddocks and therefore seen as the, the basic minimum requirement for managed grazing. As an extension from that, we may choose to use a mixture of temporary electric fencing and perhaps more permanent electric fencing. And we talk about the differences between temporary and permanent electric fencing, as well as the materials available in part three. This setup may give us eight paddocks and the use of permanent electric fencing provides a little bit more resilience and also may be able to reduce our labor. We now have two water troughs, they each serve four paddocks and in the permanent electric fences, there are gates to allow the movement of stock and people. The temporary electric fences being more flexible would be reeled in or even pinned down to allow stock to cross. Based on this design, we can sometimes add additional fences. However, the things to be aware of is with this triangular shape, sometimes leads to additional pugging around the water trough and uneven pasture utilization as the animals travel towards the trough and then don't make as much use of the areas away from the trough. Another option for design is one which uses flexible fences. This reduces the cost, but increases the labor needed. In this situation, we have the, this field or block has been split in half with a permanent electric fence. And then we're using a series of three temporary electric fences, which move with the animals, as well as a trough, which is moved around and connected to a series of quick release hydrants. This means you need one trough per animal group. And the system is very flexible, i.e. it's easy to change rotation length. Whereas when you have fixed paddocks, you have to go somewhat through the gears in order to change your rotation length. Whereas here, you can just vary the area given each day or as often as you move the fence and the rotation length is changed. So more flexible, but comes with a higher cost or higher la a higher labor input. In any system, it's important to remember that to achieve best past utilization and especially to avoid pugging in wet weather, we're not looking to exceed a four to one ratio. So if the width of our paddock is 100, the depth should be at least 25 meters. And it's important to consider that whenever we're erecting an electric fence, whether that's temporary or permanent. So let's have a look at some examples. But before we do, let's consider what you might information you might need to provide in order to design your own system. So it's really helpful to make a plan showing the number and length of fences, the type of fences, so whether they're permanent or temporary and how many wires they might have, the number of gates and their location, and the number of troughs and or hydrants that you might need in the system. And an example is shown on the page opposite. You can create your plan using a pen and paper, or you can use any of the free apps that are now available, including Google Earth, Bing, or Magic Maps, or various mobile phone apps, both of which can be really useful when trying to work out even paddock sizes and also the length of fences that might be required. A plan helps to gain clarity, helps to test that the layout is logical in terms of it allows animals to move freely in a rotation, and also can be used to supply to people um, such as ourselves, Progressive Farming Company, so that we can help advise on materials required and provide quotations. So, looking at some examples, here is a large field that is now being going to be split into eight paddocks it's using a mixture of permanent electric fence, which is the red line through the middle, and temporary electric fences. The permanent electric fence is going to be three wires because the farm has both sheep and cattle. The temporary electric fences for this year will be one wire because the field is intended to be grazed with cattle, and in this case, cows and calves. Effort's been put in to make the paddocks even in size, so that will simplify the grazing management. Although the orientation of some of the fences has had to be adapted to cope with a gully, which you can see in the top right hand corner. Two permanent troughs are going to be installed and each trough will supply four paddocks. The design could have included a mobile trough that moved with the animals, but 
due to limited labour availability, it was felt that a permanent trough was more suitable in this case. In this example, we can see how this idea around creating paddocks and, and dividing up larger fields has been extended. And in, in this example, we see an area which is three fields and it's been divided into a total of 19 paddocks. This is unlikely to be used with just one group and we're likely to see three separate groups of animals being rotated here. In this example, a whole block has been designed, which will be run using dairy heifers. Some of the existing fields, for instance, field 11 and 13, were already of the right size, i.e. they could be grazed by the group within three days. And therefore subdivisions only been necessary in some of the larger fields. The yellow fences are temporary, but they're likely to be erected at the start of the season to reduce labour. The black lines indicate permanent fences and they're intended to be two wires. Power is going to be supplied to all those fences from a mains energizer and using something called a power lead out. This again is covered in part three, but it's included here in the design section because it may influence our, or the orientation of some of our fences. So in this case, some of the fences and the angles have been adapted to ensure efficient use of materials and a logical route to take power from the energizer to all of the fences in all of the fields. Here's another example. And in this case, the customer was interested in a mob grazing system. So this required a shorter on time and potentially a longer rotation, allowing plants to recover more, more fully. This also required, this meant therefore more cells or paddocks were needed. And hence the design here, which has quite a high number of cells for the animal group. In this example, due to low water pressure and therefore low flow rate, again, permanent troughs were required. And each of these troughs services a number of paddocks. The customer in this case was likely to use temporary electric fencing and to move the fences regularly, allowing the animals to move, orientating the location of the fences so that a trough was always available. The red lines indicate a permanent electric fence. In this example, on a relatively large block, shows a paddock grazing system which was intended to be used by two groups. The red lines are permanent electric fences, the white are temporary, and the yellow shows areas of power lead out being used to connect the fences up so that one energizer could power the majority of all of the fields. Again, care has been taken to try and get the paddock sizes even and equal to simplify grazing management. Hope you found part two useful. Join us in part three, we'll be discussing electric fencing, both temporary and permanent.